Hello Tigers! Welcome once again to yet another fun and exciting Friday um, video lecture. And, um, ooh, stupid thing. I'm gonna fix my, um, gonna fix my equipment so that it doesn't suck. Um, this is the story of my life. And I can never remember which direction to pull the stupid, um, there we go. I think that'll, that's good enough. Okay, um, so we when we were so rudely interrupted by the um, the arrival of the end of class last time, we were talking about um, a media richness theory and um, artificial richness. Um, and I hadn't quite had the opportunity to put all those bricks together to form, you know, with all those you know, to form a complete wall. Um, so I'm going to back up a little bit. There's going to be a little bit of overlap here. You just have to go back to the spot where it seems like the you know the most logical. We had we talked about media richness, right? And the concept: how the richer the media is, the more lifelike it is, the leaner it is, the more of the side stream data and the little bits that are internal built-in bullshit detectors depend upon to, you know, filter out the bullshit has been stripped away. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to start a slideshow from here, and there we go, yeah. Um, so, the trends in media richness, we're talking about the trends in media richness. Transmissible media experiences since the invention of the telegram in 1837 have moved from lean to rich. So we've gone um, from telegrams that got enriched into voice messages, that is telephone calls, <clears throat> excuse me, radio beeps that got enriched from Morse code into voices and eventually pictures, becoming television, newspaper pages that got enriched from black and white to text to color images and eventually became interactive on your phone or whatever, and even in the most lean formats today, um, SMS, text messages, email, etc., um, you, you can add images to. Okay, so since 1837, media have gotten ever richer. But there's a key difference between the richness that has been added to the media since then and the richness that was taken out of it in the um, time leading up to that point. Throughout human history, richness has been an index of trustworthiness, right? It's richness that gives you all the complex bouquet of information <clears throat> that your brain intuitively processes <clears throat> to evaluate the truth claim of a person who is talking to you. Um, we've, uh, from, and, and throughout human history with media, from singing to writing to telegraphing, we've depended on and accounted for all, you know, what's remaining of it, because obviously there's less to work with when you're, when you're looking at handwriting on a page. There's less to work with when, you know, it's, it's, you know, a telegraph message. But the, but the, um, the, the side stream data that's there is real. It's dependable. That's no longer the case. Um, <clears throat> if you look into somebody's eyes while they're telling you that, you, while you're telling them rather that you that they've won, um, you know, a uh, an iPod and all they not an iPod, an iPad, and all you have to do is pay twenty dollars for shipping and handling, <clears throat> you're a lot more likely to believe them than if they tell you that in the email because the side stream data will back them up if they're telling you the truth, which they probably aren't, of course. Um, and, and that, of course, is because of those subtle cues that we send in face-to-face -face communication. And those have been a pretty good bullshit detector throughout human history. You know, hundreds of thousands of years we've been doing it that way. But what new media storytelling tools have done is they've changed that radically and completely. And your grandma and doesn't fully internalize that yet, which is why she's so much more susceptible to bullshit than your parents are, and your parents are more susceptible to bullshit than you are. And here's why this is happening now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Any piece of media you consume is going to contain two components. The content, which is, of course, the information that you're receiving, and the carrier, which is the artifact, a phonograph record, a mathematical code, whatever, that carries the information. And the way this works is the original gets reduced to the message content so that it will fit through the portal created by the carrier. Example, letter from your friend. The original is your friend talking to you. The content is the written words that she has reduced her thoughts to so that it can be carried to you. The carrier is a piece of paper with letters typed on it or written. 
that's an old media example. It's completely different from talking to your friend in person, but you are holding in your hand a physical artifact of your friend, right? The side stream data is much reduced, but it's there. You're holding it, and it's not a simulacrum. It's real. Um, your friend bought the paper and the pen and created an original work of art made out of her resources, her time, and her thoughts, which you now hold in your hand. And if she invents cold fusion next year, that letter will be worth money someday as an artifact. It's the hand of, of my cold fusion inventor friend um, actually wrote these words. It's people collect autographs for this reason. But now say you talk to your friend on Skype. Uh, the content is the same as talking in person. The only difference is the carrier, which is almost invisible. The content on Skype is literally simulating part of the reality of talking to your friend. If you don't watch out, it can be very tempting to think of it all as one and the same experience, but it is not. <clears throat> and you know this because um, if you transcribe the conversation, if you record the conversation that you had with your friend and your friend becomes the next Nikola Tesla, invents cold fusion or whatever, that recording won't really be worth anything. It won't, certainly won't be worth as much as a, a handwritten letter with her signature on it. Um, because one of those is a real item. One of them has objective reality. It's a piece of the genuine side stream data, and the other one is a simulacrum. It's a very effective simulacrum, um, and you assume that it matches up with reality, but how do you know? It could be a deep fake, one of those videos that people are, were so wigged out about not too long ago, in which Nicolas Cage's face was placed on all kinds of different people, and President Obama's um, um, video image was made to confess to having robbed a 7-Eleven in Trump Tower or whatever. That didn't really happen, but it could have um, if somebody had wanted to, to build one of those videos. Um, the point is, it's a copy of something and not an original, um, so the difference between the letter and the Skype call is a vast increase in richness, but the richness comes at a price of authenticity. And that authentic that richness is fully synthetic. It can be manipulated, like President Obama's image confessing to having robbed the Starbucks concession in Trump Tower, which he didn't do. I'm just saying if, if that video came out as a deep fake, um, you would know that that was what had happened because... Um, um, inauthentic richness, synthetic richness, is fully manipulatable. Um, you know, um, noticing when that is a possibility is the key. When is it possible that stuff can be manipulated? Now, the concept of synthetic richness, of message content being separate from the message carrier, this is a brand new experience for humans. The, the um, message content and side stream data was baked into the carrier until the digital age. Now, the, the carrier is, you know, light and, and, and smoke. It's, it's here and it's gone, and all that's left is a simulacrum written to order from it. And all of the side stream data that's in that simulacrum is synthetic. It's, um, we, we, we hope it matches up with reality, but we have no guarantees. We don't really know. We have just the tools that we talk about in this course to try and dope out whether it is or not. Um, and, and, you know, knowing who's talking. Well, I mean, this is all, this is brand new for humans. Brand spanking new. Um, literally, you know, less than 100 years old. Uh, 20,000 years ago, before writing was invented, the only carrier was the content source. If you had something to tell somebody, you went there and stood in front of them and said it. There was no daylight between the message carrier and the message content. You're watching the message being made in real time right now. That's the kind of communication that humans are hardwired to handle with tremendous sophistication because, of course, we are communicating uh, social creatures. Um, which is why skilled in-person liars are so rare. They're actually militated against by the forces of... of um, um, uh, evolution because they make such poor team players um this is why the, you know the, the and it's also why lying is, is is sort of frowned upon by every human society um 
although some of them make a, kill a bit of a fetish out of it, but that's another story. Well, okay, so that, that's the, the original condition. Soon after that, the carrier became another person. So like the boss or king or chief or whatever would dictate a message to a messenger, and the messenger would be like, got it, got it, okay, I'll go, and then would hustle out there and recite it to the person who was supposed to get it. Now, notice that this makes the king's message much more abstract than if he had delivered it, per delivered it personally. It's like, this is what this person is saying. Oh, is that so? But you're not looking into those baby blues. So that will be important, and I'll have more on that in a little bit. Okay, then a thousand, few thousand years ago, writing comes along, and the carrier shrinks even further. And now, instead of a person, you've got a piece of paper with, with ink on it, or a clay tablet with dents in it. A few hundred years ago, the printing press was developed, and it shrank even more, not physically, but in terms of the amount of time and money that the message represented. Then, in 1837, the artifacts literally became invisible, and for the first time, a message was fully intangible. Um, the carrier was reduced to electrical pulses on a wire, and that is when the real revolution started that I've been talking about here. We had entered the era of transmissible media content. Transmissible media is free media, pure information, not tied to a carrier, not baked into anything. It's just information that's happening here and at the, at the receiving station at the same time, and you're just transcribing it. Now, the carrier wasn't done shrinking. The amount of bandwidth that you needed to send a message in Morse code was huge. But now carrier and content had been fully separated. And the importance of that fact wasn't immediately clear, but it would be soon. When the richness came back, it was added to the content, but the carrier stayed completely invisible because, of course, that was the new normal. Invisible carrier, rich content. The richness was not a real richness. It was a described richness that was rendered when it arrived. So seeking to communicate a story claiming the story is true and real, but whether that fact, feeling, or emotion or story is real and true or not is completely irrelevant to its existence. It does not stop being what it is if it's bullshit. That the former, um, <clears throat> formerly, the message stopped being what it was if it was bullshit. Um, but that's not the case when it's described and rendered because, you know, it, it, it may be true it may be false, but it doesn't really matter because it renders its own fully rich pseudo-reality, which may or may not match up with the actual reality reality. In other words, the richness of all modern media, true or false, good or bad, is classic Frankfurtian bullshit. As defined by Harry G. Frankfurt, it's all bullshit. Now, it isn't all bullshit in a practical sense because some of it's true and some of it's not, but it doesn't have to be. Well, we might represent reality. It might represent reality. We, we hope it represents reality. We often assume it represents reality, but we have no guarantees. And it usually wants something from us, right? It wants us to do something or buy something or say something. Get us to do so. It appeals to a reality that we have no intrinsic reason to believe exists. Um, now, I should qualify that. We have no intrinsic reason to believe it exists. By intrinsic reason, I mean a reason that's baked into the message itself. A message that references itself. This is a real story from the New York Times, and you can tell because it looks just like a story from the New York Times, is bullshit. I mean, it's probably bullshit, right? That's an in intrinsic appeal, appealing within the message for um, validation and verification. Extrinsic ma appeal, yeah, you can do that. You can be like, okay, well, let's just look up the New York Times website. And unless someone has been very clever and hacked the New York Times website, you'll soon discover that it wasn't an actual New York Times article, um, probably. Um, so that's an extrinsic reason. So if you've got an extrinsic reason to believe that a piece of media is real, or an extrinsic reason to believe that the source of the material is trustworthy, um, then you're golden. Um, if, you've, if you've got nothing like that, and what you're basically doing is looking at a piece of media that's trying to claim that it is what it looks like it is mm -hmm. because of what it looks like, well, you can see the circular reason is in there. It's just going around and around and around and around. And the fact that it's appealing to itself in that way is a definite red flag. So that's the thing. Um, we, um, we have to rely on, for confirmation of any piece of media, on something that's conveyed to us outside of the source, or we're on very dangerous ground. Um, well, we, we should. I mean, we can all, we all choose to take risks every day, 
there is a point at which this becomes ridiculous. I, I mentioned earlier in, in class when I was back in the old days when I was in the, in the uh, newspaper racket, an editor told me, you know, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. Well, had we but world enough in time, Tom, right? I mean, because if I have to stop and think about whether my mom loves me every time she says, I love you, kiddo, um, then that's, that's a big, giant, colossal waste of time because I have extrinsic reasons other than, you know, uh, checking it out um, to, to believe my mother when she says something like that to me. Um, and presumably you do too. But um, just taking stuff at face value because it looks like something is a risk that you may want to take if it's a low stakes thing and the time that wouldn't be involved in checking on it is more valuable than the, the, um, the potential damage that would be caused by depending on something that turns out to be bullshit. But then the other thing too is that once you've been burned by something like that, you remember. Don't get fooled again. The biggest breakthrough on the dig on the uh, on the um, the um, synthetic richness front has been digitization of content. That is the reduction of the carrier to the tiniest possible nuggets of data, binary code, which can be manipulated as needed. In other words, the content has been completely removed from the carrier. It's on the carrier now, but it could be on a different one tomorrow, right? And with the analog media, it's on the carrier. And it's being rendered when you when it gets there. I mean, I'm talking about transmissible media now, right? It's on the carrier, uh, a radio wave, right? It's to be rendered when it gets there, but it can only be rendered by the same machine that 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 sent it because it's analog. But with digital stuff, it can be rendered on anything. It could be um, it could exists as its own thing, independent even of the carrier. Which is why your cell phone system works on a hybrid electrical optical radio system, right? Your you make a phone call um, that goes by radio to the cell tower by um, um, fiber optic and copper wires to another cell tower and by radio to your friend's phone. Um, this code, this binary code, works on any carrier, even smoke signals if you've got enough time and firewood. Um, <clears throat> all digital content exists only as a pattern of information that can be decoded by any machine that can read it. And a simulacra of the content can be rendered by any machine. The hell is that? I think it's construction. Okay, anyway. Um, can be rendered by any machine with a printer, speaker, monitor, or whatever is necessary to render it. So another thing to consider, the farther a message gets from its original fully rich source, the more abstract it becomes, getting more and more stripped down to the bare message. And the further along that abstraction path we go, the less we feel its reality. Um, this is why very lean media make it so comfortable to violate social norms. As the nasty troll calling down personal maledictions on you from behind his computer keyboard knows it 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 abstracts the re, the author's per responsibility rather and, and and an example of that um if you in ham in the the play hamlet the shakespeare play hamlet which most people have seen in movie form or something gosh i wish that whoever is doing that would stop actually i think that's the heater vent oh that's just awesome so that means it's not going to go away when somebody gets finished putting their ikea bookshelf together Okay, sorry about that. Um, in Hamlet, Hamlet sends his treacherous friends Rosencrantz and Guildenstern overseas. At least he thinks they're treacherous. By this time, he's deep in his paranoia. A carrying a letter ordering their execution. Hamlet as a play is all about an indecisive guy who can't take this kind of executive action, right? He's, his, his, he's, clear, he's got a clear mandate to kill his uncle because his uncle killed his dad and married his mom. So he's going to avenge dad and but he just can't pull it off. But he can write a death warrant for later because it abstracts his hands from the physical blood that they're about to spill. And, you know, that's no problem. So you start seeing more of that as well. Media used as a substitute for courage or evilness or whatever is holding you back from doing what you think that you want to do. This, of course, is why um, sending people to their deaths is, I mean, it, it is, is easier by text message. <laughs> No, um, I and mean, of course that's not the only thing that abstraction makes easier. Here's an example from about five years ago that was that was, that was created by someone as a funny, um, uh, 
which sort of demonstrates I make no representation that this is an actual real exchange. In fact, I'm pretty sure that it's not, but it demonstrates pretty well. All of this was a big shift in a couple ways. For our purposes, though, this is the big one. It moved communication into the realm of simulacra. Now, before you delivered a real letter to your correspondent, now you delivered code that could be rendered into something that looked like a letter. If you had the opportunity to purchase, and, you, and the inclination, to purchase a, um, a movie poster signed by Bruce Campbell, um, you would, there's probably something amount that you would pay for that. Or let's, let's be, maybe, well, how about, how about um, yeah, Bruce Campbell, perfect. There's an, there's an amount of money that you would pay for that, um, which is, I guarantee it, larger than the amount of money that you would pay for a digitally scanned move, um, image of Bruce Campbell's, you know, move, the same movie poster with Bruce Campbell's signature already printed on it, a digitally scanned. It's the same signature. It looks exactly the same. What's the difference? Well, one of them's real, and the other one's a simulacrum. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, um, in other words, like I said, all digital media is Frankfurtian bullshit. It exists independent of reality. It's supposed to represent reality usually, and usually it does, but there's no reason, absolutely no reason why it has to. The only reason you should believe a digital media asset isn't bullshit is because of who created it. And that's basically it. Or if there's someone who didn't create it, but certifies it, you, that that um, works too, depending on who's certifying it. It used to be that you could depend on the difficulty involved in manipulating some stuff so that it looks just right, right? But that really only applies to video today, and even that is putty in the hands of the skilled. Um, and so you end up with a lot of content that's like this text breakup exchange. It could be real, it could be fake. What is there to suggest that, it, that, that we should trust it? The only thing that it gives us to say that we should trust it is that it looks like what it happens on our iPhones when we have a text exchange with somebody. Gosh, it looks just like that. It must be real. That's a self, that's an intrinsic verification system and is not to be trusted. Um, I figure there's about a 2% chance it's legit, but we still chuckle about it because it really doesn't, I mean, does it really matter if it's real or not? Um, well, not really. Not in this case. In another case, it could be a big deal. Okay, now let's look at this. what this change has done to content. Remember, we've passed the point where content and carrier are bound together. We're talking now about free, unattached content. But in order to get fully rich content in a digital environment, you need a lot of bandwidth. And since 1837, the richness of, ca of transmissible media content has always been limited by the capabilities of the carrier. More bandwidth carrier, more richness. Less bandwidth carrier, less richness. A simple one-to-one -one relationship. So bandwidths have gotten better and better, and we've unlocked more and more levels of synthetic richness capable of duplicating more and more of our experienced world. And here's the key. Say I send you a message fully rich. Your experience receiving it may not be the same as my experience sending it. You may be seeing and reacting in real time to my facial expressions and eye contact and all that stuff. I may be seeing nothing. I'm seeing nothing right now. You're seeing and reacting in real time to my facial expressions, and I am performing for a piece of glass that's right over there, and talking into a piece of plastic that's right here, and um, annoying you with banging and rattling and stuff like that. But um, you're an abstraction to me, and I am, as you're, as you're viewing this, um, I am um, synthetic right now. Uh, if I had the skills, I could, um, you know, I could, I could make myself, well, I could just, actually, I could just say whatever, you know, whatever bullshit I want to on this thing. Um, but here's the thing. Um, the reason this is important to always keep in mind, um, this, this asymmetrical richness thing, Right? that I'm talking to a piece of glass and you are interacting with or at least watching a, a simulacrum of me talking to you. 
The reason that's important is because of what richness is in specific terms. And in 2000 BC, when 20,000 BC, when you spoke to another person, you were delivering rich content, like I said, right? You, and you've heard it said, I'm sure, that only 7% of communication is what you say, and the other 73 or 93% <laughs> is nonverbal. It's a good thing I'm not a math professor, um, is nonverbal. Now, I don't think those figures are accurate. I don't see how they could have been obtained, and I don't think they're even close to what I would estimate as a real division, but let's stipulate them. For demonstration purposes, we'll just use them. We'll just say, okay, let's assume they're accurate. Think of the 93% as the richness. The side stream content, the tone of voice, eye contact, body language, um, stuff like that. The side stream data, the 93%, is important because we're humans. Historically, most of our built-in bullshit detection skills focus on this side stream data. It is damn hard to lie to somebody while looking him or her in the eye. I'm a millionaire. I really am. I have a million dollars in the bank account right now, and I'm going to use it to buy myself a, a position as an ambassador in the incoming Biden administration. You know, right? I just lied to you. But it's it was easy because I'm lying to a, I'm looking into a, um, a camera and, and lying to that camera. Um, I'm not getting feedback from you. Um, it's much, well, that wasn't really a lie either. That was just, that was just a, a bit of, of non-true bullshit that I knew you weren't going to believe, um, which is really different actually from a, from a lie. The, the thing is, the reason it's hard to lie to somebody while looking them in the eye is that the side stream data gives you away. The person you're lying to may not spot the lie straight off. They'll probably pick up on something, though, and not completely trust you. There are, in fact, a bunch of pseudoscientific books out there just now about using, quote-unquote, micro-expressions to spot liars, and generally they don't work because all that stuff happens subconsciously. And if you if you bring it to the to the the surface and start trying to use it consciously, all you end up doing is filtering out all the people who don't have the same social, you know, conscious social skill sets. Um, all of that stuff in, in, in many of our, in many of our modif mediated interactions is completely unreliable, worse than unreliable, it's manipulatable. Uh, manipulatable, because the thing is we've now exchanged, we've changed the paradigm. It used to be more rich equals more real. It was a way that you could certify authenticity. The richer it was, the more confident you could be that if everything rang true, it was the, it was the real thing. This change in the paradigm happened short, started shortly after the telephone was invented, as progressive inventions started adding that side stream data back into media transmission. So telephones carrying voices and movies carrying images, it's all digitally encoded and transmitted. What's different with each new invention is the technology to transmit more density of information. So you get ever richer media coming through ever broader band channels. That richness is fully artificial, but a person who's accustomed to the level of richness that's possible in a radio transmission can be completely gobsmacked and, and, and totally fooled by the level of, 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 me, of richness in a um, uh, television trans interaction as was the case in this episode. This is Richard Nixon in 1953, or 52, I think. It, maybe it was 50. Anyway, early 50s, looking into the camera and saying that he did not steal some money or, you know, misallocate, whatever the, the, the official legal term for what he did was. It was money, and he wasn't supposed to have it, and, and, and he had it. Um, supposed to be for his campaign, I guess, and he, you know, used it. For personal stuff. Um, so we got that fully rich, the, the, much richer than people were used to experience of Dick Nixon looking very honest and trustworthy, looking into the camera and saying, no, I didn't do that. That's the kind of thing Democrats do, not good cloth coated Republicans like me. Uh, and, I mean, okay, now I'm going to have to, now I'm going to have to slam a Democrat because I want to be nonpartisan here. But, um, the, <laughs> But no, Dick Nixon is just kind of a special case. Um, the thing is, the people who fell for this were the same people who had um, learned a powerful lesson from that whole, um, um, whoa, I'm just blanking on this stupid thing now, War of the Worlds, the War of the Worlds radio drama in 1938. Um, everyone had, had internalized that. Everyone knew that, you know, what, 
radio could be done to what what the tools of radio could be used to manipulate people's um, emotions and stuff like that. Um, but but they weren't used to television yet, so they were sitting ducks. And Dick Nixon pulled it off. Um, he's he's not looking into the camera because it's interacting with him. Obviously, he's looking into it because he knows the people watching the film need to feel as if he's interacting with them. Every time you look at a camera, every time you smile for a picture you are making the same calculation. You're manipulating data to create or help create a synthetic reality that doesn't exist in the concrete world. Well, I mean, me smiling really big exists in the world right now, but it won't exist when you see this. It'll be its own separate reality. It will be a simulacrum of something that happened some time ago. We all do this, though, in, in, in little ways every day. Some of us do it in big ways. Here's Stephen Colbert back when he had his own show. Except, can we be sure that that's Colbert and not an intern in a suit wearing that garbage can helmet? And Colbert is backstage someplace with his iPad or his phone or whatever, um, filming himself in the face like this, um, under specially prepared lights to make it look like his head is inside the camera? Yeah, okay, um, it's probably him, but we actually don't know. That's a simulacrum. Um, you go to a movie that sure looks like Bruce Willis, but it's not. It's the it's the film. It's it's a it's a it's a a, a thing that no longer exists. I um, mean, Bruce Willis exists, but he's not doing the exact stuff. Um, you Skype with your mom. Boy, that sure looks like your mom, but it's actually your iPad. Um, your your mom is having the same experience with her computer at the same time. Each of you is interacting with a simulacrum of the other. The point is, digital media exists in its own reality space. How closely that reality matches up with real reality is up to you, your mom, and the FaceTime software, and the National Security Agency. Um, sometimes you might, sometimes you might just choose to, to, to play with that independence from reality. Obviously, playing with Photoshop is a way that people play with that independence from reality while still kind of allowing themselves to, for fun, interact with it as if it were reality. Um, obviously, the difference between these two images, one represents reality and the other one doesn't, but each of them is completely unrestrained, unconstrained by the whole reality thing. Um, for instance, that cow is free to have legs that are, looks like about eight feet long, actually, with longer ones on the back. Uh, <laughs> Each one is free to be whatever it, the hell it wants, you know, reality be damned. The history of all media since 1837 has been the story of populations learning to cope with this change. Um, the sidestream data in a TV show is all fake. The actors are looking at an inanimate object. You know, pull out your, your cell phone right now, look into the lens, start a recording, and tell it a whopper. Right? Um, I am no longer robbing banks for fun and profit. Um, pretty easy, right? It's still, I mean, it's just a box. Um, now try that with your mom. Or better yet, don't. In 1956, Richard Nixon did a great job with this, of this with the checkers speech. There it is. I said early 50s. I was blanking the, the date, but it was 1956. Um, to the people who watched Nixon, it felt like they were being spoken to personally by someone sitting in their living room. Um, Nixon gave none of the cues that he would have given if he'd been actually talking to them, that he was lying, you know, kind of like looking around, looking uncomfortable. So they reacted to his speech in the same way that they would react to a fully rich conversation with a human being. Not quite understanding, or maybe if they did understand, not internalizing, that it wasn't fully rich, that it was synthetically rich. People unaccustomed to artificial richness in media are sitting ducks for this kind of thing. This, the very practice of propaganda is the manipulation of the, of the margin between what people have gotten used to and what's possible, right? The, 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 here's a classic example. If you actually saw a scene like this in real life with actual people and not silhouettes, you'd know exactly what was going on. You've got a burly, mustachioed German soldier dragging a frightened, nightgown-clad underage girl out of bed looking for a secluded place to rape her or something like that. Um, but, of course, the whole thing was made up. And people seeing it knew that as well, but it triggered emotional reactions in them because they're conditioned to um, interpreting imagery as reality. Um, all the sidestream data that goes with this picture is synthetic and created and manipulated by the artist, but 100,000 years of human experience have conditioned us to respond to that kind of sidestream content. What's amazing is how quickly 
we adjust and adapt, which suggests that this is a matter of some evolutionary concern for humans, that this is a thing that it's, it's like a do or die kind of response to changes in our, in our um, information environment. Um, because as the century wore on, manipulating sidestream content became an art, but it became a, a fast moving art because people got smart. Um, it became several arts actually. Um, with new digital tools, you can manipulate sidestream data in an unbelievable variety of ways. You can change a photo so it has a whole different meaning, changing the context of the accompanying news article or caption. Um, the, the, the new environment has made it very easy for fakers to, uh, to, to craft bullshit that to a naive person looks very believable, but it also makes it necessary for them to, to, to manage a lot of really complex factors when they tell lies. It's pretty easy to type a lie in a letter and mail it, you know, free of giveaway sidestream content, but it is harder to create a website or a letter, a Twitter stream or informational vi YouTube video, although you're not giving it away in your sidestream content. Um, you may be giving it away in the way you're producing it and stuff that doesn't quite add up with other stuff because there's a lot of things to keep straight. Bullshitters have a hard time pulling it off. And that's mostly the key to bullshit detecting in the 21st century. Noticing the spots where the subtext isn't quite right or is too perfect, where the aesthetics of the video are too neat and tidy, where the side stream data feels cooked, where the news item reinforces all the classic Marxist talking points or sounds right out of an Ayn Rand novel. Um, it's following up on those spots to learn whether they're innocent quirks or hallmarks of bullshit. Try to notice the side stream content in your media consumption. What story is it telling? Can you trust the source? Is there a dissonance? Simple awareness of how you receive information as you consume media is one of the fundamental skills that many people just don't develop, and it's critical to being able to spot bullshit. Most bullshit is implied rather than stated, because it's easier to do that because you own it more if you have reached the conclusion yourself. And I can demonstrate this to you. If you've ever read a book in which everything is spelled out, so like, you know, you get a, a, a character says, um, you, you got some gangsters talking and, and, the, and the big one says, there's, there's not enough money in here, Jonesy. Are you, uh, are you stealing from me? And Jonesy's saying, uh, no boss. Um, it's all here. That's all I got. I swear. Um, you've picked up from the side, you know, from the subtext in that little interaction between the two gangsters that there's a power differential between the two of them. One of them is a boss. The other one probably stole something from him and is about to get caught and probably murdered, right? So if at that point in the story, the author says, Bugsy did not believe the little rat and thought maybe it would be a good idea to go ahead and murder him right now. The little, uh, the little guy, Jonesy, realized, real, um, realized that he was in a lot of trouble you know, and just kind of like unpacking all of the um, all of the subtext for you and feeding it to you with a spoon like you couldn't figure it out for yourself. First of all, you'd be really bored. And secondly, you would not be invested in the story. You wouldn't be helping tell it. It would be a story that was ex that was happening, but you weren't experiencing it. And it's the same way with bullshit. People will try to get you to draw the conclusion yourself so that you will have some ownership of it and so you will be invested in it. Um, yeah. The idea being to manipulate you into thinking it's your idea. Another important point, two-way content. We're not hardwired for mass communication like we are for interpersonal kind. Sidestream data in real life is a two-way affair. Um, as the receiver is, is observing your body language, you're observing theirs. It's like a subliminal dance and you'll be reacting to things that you see in there. And this is subliminal too. This isn't something that you think about. You'll be reacting to how you see them reacting to what you're saying. Um, this is why it's so hard to look in someone's eyes and, and tell a lie that's going to hurt them. There's a psychological barrier to doing that. You'll be uncomfortable and that discomfort will tip them off. In video, the side stream content just flows one way. And the receiver observes the, the, the sender's side stream content, facial expressions, gestures, body language, eye contact with the camera as if in person, creating the illusion of intimacy. The same person comes into your home night after night, same gentle voice, or week after week, you know, a friendly voice telling you about bullshit. 
Um, that would be me. Um, and, and, and yeah. Um, so meanwhile, the sender is observing nothing but a dead piece of glass. And this makes it possible to say almost anything without any of those pesky nonverbal cues getting in the way because there's no discomfort in lying to an inanimate object. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know why. This is Anthony Weiner. I have no idea why I, I put a picture of him on here to do, to do this. I, I just, I gotta change it because it just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, this is Stuart Smalley, of course, and he's he's talking to that mirror. Um, and and it, it's, um, so the richness of the media experience is starkly asymmetrical. You watching me on TV get a full, rich experience of my manners and, and speech and eye contact and stuff, and I never see you, so I'm speaking to a dead object. Which leaves me free to concentrate on giving the most convincing performance I can. Um, I have here queued up <clears throat> a short speech from Richard Nixon, a piece of the actual t the thing, which I'm going, to, I'm going to start off on Monday in class by playing this because I don't think it works here. You won't get the effect kind of like second hand. Um, um, so I, I'll do that. And then I've also got um, President Clinton telling a lie on TV because um, we do have to be bipartisan about this. And I'll, Sorry, Bill. You're no Dick Nixon. <laughs> I don't think that's a good thing. Um, yeah, so um, I'll show those the first thing Monday morning so that we can actually see them. Um, meanwhile, how this translates into bullshit detection? Know who's talking. Uh, but a subtle distinction, know what's going on with the person who's talking, too. If they're talking to a TV camera, that's that the performance that they're giving, the things that they're saying, the way they're acting... Do they make sense in the context of what they're actually doing, or do they only make sense in the context of what they appear to be doing, i.e. looking into your eyes and talking to you? But that's not what they're doing. So if they're trying to look like that, then that's a little bit of a red flag. Well, everybody's going to try to look like that somewhat. I'm trying to look like that right now because I don't want to bore your socks off. I mean, I don't want to bore your other sock off. You know, I'm, I'm already bored. You know, one is enough. Um, if it feels like it would be unnatural or insincere to say things and look like that at an inanimate object or under the circumstances in which the person who is talking is, not appears to be, but is, then, yeah, be wary. Um, and I do have, a, um, I do have a, a video to show you that kind of demonstrates this pretty nicely. Uh, Jimmy Kimmel sent, uh, or put up one of the Olympic um, athletes at Sochi to um, a prank in which supposedly they were filming a wolf in the hall. And I'll show this to you in class if I can, if I can remember to. <clears throat> but as you're watching the video, um, you'll see that the camera that is following the wolf through the hall is behaving like an eye. It's behaving like somebody's actually peeking. It's not behaving the way a camera on a cell phone would behave if you were using it to film a dangerous animal in the hall of your, your um, hotel. It peeks around the corner, following the arc that a head would take, sticking itself outside the door. Whereas if you had an animal in the hall, what you would do is you would just stick the phone out there at an angle so you could see the screen. And that way, you know, be less likely that the animal could get you. Um, but it's, it's really obvious once you notice it, but it's not very obvious at all until you do. That's all I've got for you today. This is an unusually, um, feels like an unusually long Friday lecture, but it's so 40, 45 minutes. So, um, you know, it's actually a little short. Anyway, have a great weekend and I will see you guys on Monday.